Good evening, and uh, I'm really grateful to Noel Latif and the Foreign Policy Association for having me back. I actually spoke about the first volume of my book uh, two, three years ago, but uh, there's a second volume, uh, as Bob Miller said. Uh, I'm really grateful to the Hereford Foundation uh, for not just this lecture, but uh, as Bob indicated, for the support that he's given me in uh, other projects over the years, and so it's great. I'm really appreciative in this rain that all of you have made it here, so, uh, so I'm going to talk about uh, the nature of uh, uh, global politics. Uh, I would say that the years 2014 and 15 have been really bad ones uh, in terms of global order. But the nature of the problems are really different in different parts of the world. So on the one hand, you have Eurasia, where at either end you've got two big centralized powers, Russia and China, that are on the move, they're authoritarian, they've got territorial ambitions, and they are, they're causing troubles uh, for their neighbors. But in a sense, that set of problems is a very familiar one to any student of 19th or 20th, 20th century diplomacy because the history of those centuries was really the struggle between uh, organized great powers that were coherent states. But in another part of the world that stretches from North Africa through the Arab world into sub-Saharan Africa, Afghanistan, Pakistan, really to the borders of India, the problem is almost completely the opposite. There you have a, a series of either collapsed or weak states. So in the Arab Middle East, you have this unprecedented situation where four Arab countries, Iraq, Syria, Libya, and Yemen have basically collapsed as coherent states. But there's weakness in even the places where uh, you still have um, uh, 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 state structures, uh, nominal state structures in place. Now we can discuss this in the Q&A. Uh, I'm on record as uh, believing that the Islamic State and the new generation of terrorists are actually not that big and powerful and long-lasting a political uh, movement, not compared to some of the ones that we've seen uh, in the 20th century. Uh, the reason that I think that, and the reason that I think they are a problem, is not that they offer such an attractive way of life uh, to people in that region, it's because everybody else around them is so weak. And the reason that this kind of terrorism is flowing into the places that it's going to, places like Pakistan, Yemen, Afghanistan, and now into Nigeria, Mali, uh, all over the Sahel, is because these are pre precisely the parts of the world that do not have coherent states. Uh, the Nigerian government uh, should have been able to control this Boko Haram insurgency, but it is one of the most feckless and corrupt governments uh, of any. It's a government that has managed to waste about half a trillion dollars in oil revenues over the last generation, still has 70% of its population uh, living under the poverty line. And so I think that the state weakness uh, is really the central uh, issue, and that has been the issue that American foreign policy has tried to deal with since September 11th. So we had two big projects in Afghanistan uh, and Iraq, and those projects centered not over around the military defeat of terrorism, it really centered around the ability to create coherent states in both of those countries that could control terrorism on their own. And I would say, unfortunately, that the conclusion, you know, after, uh, uh, what is it now, um, uh, 13, 14 years since September 11th, uh, is that we don't know how to do this. Uh, it's not been a, a tremendous success. Uh, and therefore, the process of creating coherent states, I think, is at the center of everybody's agenda in that part of the world. That's the only way that we're going to deal with the problem of the Islamic State, is to create uh, state structures in that part of the world. And that's really what got me started on this whole two-volume book project, because in thinking about it, so I'm a political scientist, and uh, you would think that a political scientists would know where the state comes from. Uh, but 
but as I started to think about my own education, I realized that we who live in developed, stable countries so much take something like basic security state structures for granted that we don't even think about uh, the origins. And so this, this began this, this process of uh, what I called getting to Denmark. So Denmark, for me, is not the actual country Denmark. It's this mythical place that is democratic, prosperous, uh, very uncorrupt, uh, has uh, a very effective government. Uh, and in some sense, American foreign policy has been trying to get places like Haiti and Somalia and Afghanistan, get them to Denmark or some version of Denmark. Uh, and at that, uh, they really failed uh, completely. And that's partly because I don't think intellectually we understand where Denmark itself uh, came from. I can tell you that the Danes themselves don't know. Uh, I actually was a visiting professor in Denmark, and um, uh, it happened so long ago and with so much you know, clouded memory that uh, I think the, um, you know, that experience has really uh, been lost. Now, in order to understand what the task is, I need to do some definitional things. Uh, and I think that if we talk about political order, we're really talking about three very separate types of institutions. So if you'll bear with me, I want to go through these one by one. The first component of any political order is the state itself. The state was defined by the great sociologist Max Weber as a legitimate monopoly of force over territory. It's a good definition because this distinguishes states from other kinds of social uh, institutions. And it tells you something important. States are about power. States are about the ability to generate power and to use power to enforce laws, to defend the community, to provide internal security, to deliver basic services. All right? So that's the first of these institutions. The second uh, important institution is the rule of law. Now you can have rule by law, meaning that the emperor can give commands that have the, the status of law, but that's not rule of law. If the emperor himself, if the king, the president, the prime minister does not feel subject to the law, then that's not truly the rule of law. The most powerful political actors in a society have to be under the law if true rule of law is to prevail. And that indicates that the rule of law is really an institution for limiting power. All right, so the state creates and uses power, but the rule of law acts in an opposite direction to limit power, uh, to make it used according to rules that are approved by the whole community. And then finally, there is uh, democratic accountability. Uh, we understand that today as basically free and fair multi-party elections uh, by which rulers are made accountable not to just the elite uh, that, that they constitute, but to the whole of the society. Uh, the reason we have these procedures is to guarantee the substantive result of that kind of uh, mass uh, accountability. So if you think about it, a modern liberal democracy, a modern political order, is actually three uh, somewhat contradictory things. On the one hand, you've got the state, which is about using and deploying power. And then you've got these two institutions, the rule of law and democratic accountability, which are about limiting power. And you're not going to have a just or a successful political system unless there's balance. So obviously, if you have a state without the constraint institutions, uh, then you have a dictatorship, and that's basically modern China. Uh, on the other hand, if you have only institutions of constraint, but no state, I mean, at one extreme, you get Syria and, and Libya, which in which state uh, uh, power has fallen apart completely, or you have weak states where you may have elections, you may have um, some semblance of democratic accountability, but you've got a feckless government that's highly corrupt uh, and cannot deliver basic services. And that's unfortunately pretty much the situation of Iraq and Afghanistan uh, today. Now, there's one further definition that's really important, which is uh, a modern state. 
Now, a traditional or a patrimonial state uh, is a state in which the state mechanism is basically regarded as a species of private property by the rulers. The whole reason that they want political power is so that they can get wealthy. And that, in fact, was a situation when there are kings and queens. A king could give away a province as a wedding present to his daughter because, in some sense, he legally owned uh, that territory. So today, nobody dares to say that they own the country that they're ruling over. So you have what political scientists call neo patrimonialism, in which you've got the semblance of a modern state, you've got parliaments and prime ministers and so forth, but the reality is that everybody in the political system is there to enrich themselves at the expense of the public. A modern state is very different. A modern state is impersonal, meaning that your relationship to the state does not depend on whether you're a friend or a buddy of the ruling elite. It, it depends on your status as a citizen. And in a modern state, uh, it is, um, uh, there's a clear distinction between public and private, and corruption happens when public officials appropriate public money for their own uses. And therefore, you know, that's what it means to be in a modern state where corruption becomes an issue. And I would argue to you that, uh, you know, although it's true I'm a board member of the National Endowment for Democracy, and I think democracy is very important, I actually don't think that the distinction between democracy and autocratic regimes is actually, in a way, the central issue in many places. The central issue is between a patrimonial or a neo-patrimonial state on the one hand and a modern state. Uh, I'll give you some examples of this. So what's the issue in Ukraine right now or between uh, the European Union and Russia? Is it really over democracy? Now, why did those young people a couple of years ago start demonstrating uh, against the regime of Viktor Yanukovych when he decided to align with Russia rather than the European Union? It's not that he was undemocratic. Everybody admits that Yanukovych was democratic democratically elected in a reasonably free and fair election. The reason that he attracted so much opposition was the fact that he was one of the most corrupt leaders in the whole post-Soviet space. Uh, I don't know if you saw the pictures at the time of this mansion that he was building for himself outside of Kiev that was four or five times the size of the White House. His family probably succeeded in getting several billion dollars out of the country into you know, Swiss, uh, proverbial Swiss uh, bank accounts. And for those young protesters, the issue at stake was not uh, democracy per se. It was whether they wanted to live in this kleptocracy ruled by this very small elite for their own benefit, or whether they wanted to align with Europe, which for them represented political modernity, meaning an impersonal state in which public officials are meant to serve a public interest. And I would maintain that that is the big fight between us and Putin right now. If there was an election in Russia, Putin would be reelected by a very big margin. There's no question about that. But what he represents is this ability of this small elite to extract rents out of that society for their own benefit uh, primarily, all right? So that's a case where I think the, the task has really been getting to a modern state and not getting to democracy. I'll give you a couple of other examples. In India, India is one of the most successful democracies among all developing countries. It's been a, except for a couple of years under Indira Gandhi, it's been a very successful uh, multi-party, very open uh, democratic order. Uh, there was a study done by an economist uh, and activist named John Drez of several states in northern India in which he discovered that 50% of school teachers uh, were being paid as teachers, but they were not showing up for their, for their jobs, 50%, right? So there's this big hue and cry. India is a vigorous democracy. The opposition parties denounced this. The press uh, exposed this fact. After 10 years of attempted reforms, they did another survey, and they discovered that the same percentage, 50% of school teachers, were not showing up. So after 10 years of reform effort, they could not get uh, this basic you know, service provided uh, for the children in, in these parts of India. It contributes 
to inequality, it contributes to the lack of competitiveness in India. There's nobody in India that thinks it's a good thing for teachers not to show up for their jobs, and yet this very basic act of public administration seemed to be beyond, be beyond the capacity of the Indian government. And you know, there, there's other failures I mean, in terms of infrastructure, the ability to provide clean water. You know, there's half a billion people in India that don't use toilets, and uh, if you think about it, it's quite mind-boggling, but, um, but you know, this level of basic uh, infrastructure uh, has been extremely difficult for this democratic, uh, um, highly vigorously democratic uh, society to create. If we get closer to home, uh, to Europe, well, I don't know, that's not my home, but uh, if you get closer to Europe, uh, there's, a, there's a, 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 another country that's been very much in the news, which is a, another case of a certain kind of patrimonialism, which is Greece. So why did Greece uh, initially get into the uh, Eurozone conflict, um, uh, uh, crisis? Part of the reason was that Greece, like Italy, could not control its public spending. And part of the reason that it could not control its public spending was that the two Greek political parties, PESOK and New Democracy, uh, they competed very vigorously for votes. They traded places uh, on numerous occasions since the return of democracy to Greece in 1974. And every time the party came back into power, it would load the public sector up with its own party workers, school teachers, bank employees, employees, you know, customs officials, you name it. And because there's civil service protection in Greece, you couldn't fire any of the old workers. And that meant that by 2010, when the Euro crisis broke out, Greece had something like seven times the per capita number of public officials that Britain did. Uh, at that moment. And this is something that runs so deeply in Greek politics that it is still, I mean, even under this left-wing Syriza government, uh, it's not something that they've been willing to, uh, to address. And so patrimonialism, that is to say the use of political power for personal economic uh, 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 purposes uh, continues. Uh, and I would say in general that it is much easier uh, to actually get to a vigorous democracy. So Afghanistan and Iraq are actually good examples of this because there are, there are you know, both of these countries are, have held elections or at least election-like events that have produced leaders with some degree of democratic uh, legitimacy. But the one thing that has not happened in either of those countries is to produce a modern, clean public administration that could provide security, education, health care, all of the basic things that people really want uh, out of a government. All right, so that's the nature of the world. And I think those are some of the political development uh, 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 challenges. Uh, so the question is, how do you fix it, and and you know why does this stuff happen? Now, a lot of times, Americans looking at developing countries, they see this kind of patronage going on, uh, this kind of corruption. They say these people simply don't know what a modern government is like. You know, they they really we need to teach them, uh, you know, what it means to have a clean, um, a modern public service. And Americans do not understand that, in a sense, they invented this form of corruption uh, in the 19th century, and they practiced it when America was at the same level of economic development that India, Brazil, Indonesia, you know, any number of countries uh, were at. So if I can give you a little uh, history lesson, who ran the American government after the American Revolution? Well, for a couple of decades, you could say it was really the friends of George Washington. They were largely graduates of Harvard and Yale, very elite uh, Americans. But beginning in the 1820s, uh, one American state after another expanded the franchise to include all white males. There used to be a property requirement for voting, but that was eliminated. And so all of a sudden, you had a mass white male franchise. And the critical election was the 1828 election between John Quincy Adams and Andrew Jackson. John Quincy Adams was the son of the second president. He was a prototypical Boston Brahmin. He was a graduate of Harvard College. He traveled in Europe. Uh, he could speak uh, numerous European languages. 
Andrew Jackson was a frontiersman from rural Tennessee, Scotch-Irish, Indian fighter, brawler, a drinker, uh, a big military commander. He got the Seminoles and the Cherokees. Uh, uh, he, he fought wars against them, uh, very uh, tough wars. And then he was the victor of the Battle of New Orleans uh, against the British, which then propelled him into national politics. And he beat uh, John Quincy Adams. In a way, it's a polarity between a certain American elite and a certain kind of American populism, which is reflected today like in the contrast between, let's say, the Yale-educated John Kerry and Sarah Palin. Right. So Sarah Palin, I mean, part of what drives her is that she doesn't like people from Harvard and Yale running the country. But this is not a new thing in American politics. You know, this, this really goes back uh, very far. So on the basis of an expanded democratic franchise, Andrew Jackson wins the 1828 election, and he says two things. First, I won the election, so I should choose who gets to work in the US government. And second, it doesn't take a genius to operate the US government. Basically, this is a time when the average level of education in the US was probably uh, fourth grade or so, right? So this begins a 100-year period in American history known as the spoils or the patronage system in which virtually every public office from the federal government down to your local post postman uh, was given away as a result of a political payoff by a politician to some campaign supporter. And it produced Tammany Hall. It produced, you know, the Daily Machine ultimately uh, in Chicago. I mean, these famous cases of municipal corruption were all built around patronage um, uh, uh, operations like this. This only changed, uh, it only began to change in the 1880s uh, as a result of a reform movement during the Progressive Era. So by the 1880s, America was changing. It was no longer a, a predominantly agrarian society. Uh, it was industrializing. The railroads at that point were the internet of that era. They tied the North American continent together into a single market. People were moving into cities. They were getting much higher levels uh, of education. And many of those new interest groups that were formed by this economic modernization didn't like this corrupt patronage system that the country had gotten used to over the previous generations. So there was a proposal for something called the Pendleton Act that would require, uh, that would establish a civil service commission and make a civil service examination the basis for hiring into the federal government. But nobody in Congress was willing to pass this because that would undercut their basis for political power. Uh, and it would not have gotten passed but for the assassination of James A. Garfield. So Garfield was elected in 1882. He was shot by a fellow named Charles Guiteau who thought he should be the ambassador to France and was disappointed that he didn't get the job. It took Garfield about six painful weeks to die. Uh, and as a result, Congress was sufficiently embarrassed by the fact that the American president had been assassinated by a patronage seeker that they passed the Pendleton Act uh, in that Congress. And for the first time, uh, you had a modern uh, uh, creation of a classification system in which you would you had to demonstrate merit and background in order to get a job in the government rather than simply your connection to a politician. And it took the next 40 years for this to become the general practice in the American political system. And so this is why I think that there's actually hope uh, for some of these highly corrupt political systems which are subject to a lot of corruption but are also modernizing. And I would say India, Indonesia, um, you know, Mexico, Brazil, there are many countries that fall into this uh, category. All of them in the last few years, because of the high level of economic growth that we've seen in the last couple of generations, have developed middle classes and protest movements. And the strongest one is probably the one uh, in Brazil where uh, you've seen a couple of years ago, you know, people just demonstrating against corruption and bad bus service, uh, the sorts of things that ordinary citizens, you know, it, it, it matters to uh, ordinary citizens. And I think similar movements have uh, appeared in Indonesia, in India, in other places. Uh, and I think that if any of these countries are going to modernize their states, it's got to be on the basis of something like the political coalition that existed in the United States or was created in the United States during the Progressive Era. 
All right, so I'm going to conclude by talking about the last part of my book, uh, which is entitled Political Decay, because uh, one of the things that I uh, have come to realize in doing this big historical survey of political institutions is that all political systems can decay. And simply the fact that you become a consolidated liberal democracy does not mean that you are not subject to this. And unfortunately, I think that there are a lot of signs of political decay uh, in the United States. I think political decay arises from two sources. One is simple rigidity, ideological rigidity. You see the world in a certain way. Uh, you see your institutions in a certain way. You can't imagine them being otherwise. But then the world changes, and your institutions don't adapt. So that's one thing. But the other one has to do with the fact that modern impersonal institutions are in some sense unnatural. Uh, the idea that you hire a qualified person rather than a friend or a political supporter is not the first instinct that, that comes into the minds of most people. And there's this constant tendency for the rich and powerful, for elites in any society, to want to grab hold of the political system and use it to protect uh, their own uh, situations, and this has happened in, you know, many other, you know. So if you if you read volume one of my book, I, I give a lot of examples of this. Before the French Revolution, the French king was so broke that he would sell public offices uh, in a practice called venal office holding. He'd simply sell the office of treasurer of France to the highest bidder, and this person could buy the office. And not only that, he could then uh, will the office to his son, his eldest son, uh, as part of that son's patrimony, a public office, right? So we're not quite at that point in the United States, but. There are a number of um, aspects of our political system that I think are really uh, becoming quite dysfunctional. So it's really the collision of two things. And, and part of what's going on is, is what's happening in American society. So one has to do with polarization. This is a subject everybody's been talking about. I don't have a lot new to say about it, except that uh, it's measurable and it's quite real. So for most of the 20th century, the two political parties, Republicans and Democrats, overlapped. Uh, and all of the major pieces of legislation, you know, the great, uh, um, the New Deal, uh, the Great Society, the Reagan um, tax cuts were all done on the basis of a high degree of bipartisanship by these two overlapping parties. Now, uh, since the early 2000s, they're completely uh, separate. So the most liberal Republican is considerably more conservative than the most conservative Democrat. The other thing that's been going out on in society is the rise of extremely well-organized interest groups uh, that are highly professionalized. They've got a lot of money, uh, and they are very good at targeting uh, the political system to protect their own uh, to protect their own interests. So that's a kind of familiar story, but it intersects with the nature of American political institutions. The American founding fathers created a very complex system of checks and balances because I think they were quite rightly concerned primarily with the possibility of tyranny. They did distrusted and disliked strong centralized government. That's why they fought a, a revolution uh, against the British Parliament. Uh, and uh, they created a constitutional system that protected liberty by dividing power. So two powerful branches of Congress, a separately elected presidency that can be held by someone of a different party, uh, a system of courts that are able to overturn uh, ordinary legislation, and then delegation of a lot of powers to state and, and local uh, governments. Uh, and that system of checks and balances has actually been multiplying in non-constitutional ways. So senatorial holds, the filibuster, uh, there's a lot of procedures now by which it is extremely easy in the United States for a minority, a well-organized minority, to block uh, action by uh, a majority. That's 
A lot of it is cooked into the design of the Constitution, and a lot of it has been added subsequently. So if you take these two trends and you put them together, that is to say, the polarization, the rise of interest groups, and a political system that privileges well-organized minorities, you get a situation that I label vetocracy, meaning rule by veto, meaning that it is extremely easy in this country for uh, uh, these well-organized interest groups to use that system to stop things that they do not like. Now, at one level, this has led to the gridlock in Washington over things like the budget. So Congress has actually not passed a budget by its own rules since 2008. They've been doing continuing resolutions or, uh, you know, they got into this sequester almost by accident because they thought that nobody could possibly want to deal that bad, but it, sure enough, that's uh, kind of what happened. And it means that many uh, pieces of legislation that really ought to pass uh, quite easily cannot get through. Take, for example, the corporate tax rate, 35% is much higher than the average for other industrialized countries. Uh, everybody complains about that. That's why so much money is being held uh, overseas. Uh, and I think that almost every tax reformer, Republican or Democrat, would say, in principle, yes, we ought to lower that that corporate tax rate, make it more consonant with practices in other countries, and then get rid of all of the tax exemptions and privileges uh, that exist. And in fact, we have created a system of privileges in this country. So the difference between a privilege and a liberty is, is the following. A liberty is freedom from government action that applies to all people as citizens. A privilege is something that applies to only me and my family or my company uh, and to no one else. And I think if you look at the American tax code, it's really a disgrace. I mean, it's basically a catalog of privileges that have been negotiated by interest groups and then stuck in the code uh, and, and uh, extremely hard to eradicate. And the reason you can't reform any of this is because of the nature of the, the check and balance uh, uh, vetocratic system. That while collectively we would all be better off with this kind of reform, all of the particular interests that are hurt by it are powerful enough and can use the system uh, in a way that will stop uh, the reform from happening. And I think this is, you know, I, I mean, I can multiply uh, examples of this in other domains of public policy. So, for example, Two big signature pieces of legislation under Obama, Obamacare and the Dodd-Frank Act. I support both of them in principle. I think we need to regulate Wall Street and I think we need universal health care. But these pieces of legislation are monstrosities. You know, they're terrible pieces of legislation. Nobody that voted for them read you know, the actual bill because they're way too long uh, and complex. And the reason they're long and complex is that as a result of this legislative process, every interest group, you know, a lot of the actual language in this legislation is written by lobbyists because we don't have the actual capacity in Congress or in our bureaucracy to actually write the appropriate legislation. And so it's kind of delegated out uh, to the people that actually have the organization and the money to do that. So this is, I think, in a certain sense where we are in American political development, that we were the first democracy. Uh, we were, you know, in a sense, the great uh, example of uh, democracy. But I do think that there has been backsliding in the way that our institutions have operated. And then to draw this back to the international dimension, uh, I think that this matters a great deal uh, for the fate of democracy uh, around the world because in some sense the spread of democracy, it's, it's, it's the intrinsic appeal of the idea, but it's also people looking around the world and saying, what appears to be a successful society? And I think that, you know, when I started um, uh, well, I started with the NED maybe about 15 years ago. I, I think you'd have to wind the clock back a little bit further. Let's say to the 1990s, you know, right after the fall of the Berlin Wall. I do think that American democracy really was held up as the model of a good modern democratic system. And it is certainly my perception traveling around the world talking to people that this is just not the opinion that's held by a lot of uh, 
foreign observers watching uh, the way things operate in Washington. And therefore, I think that if the idea of democracy is going to be popular around the world, uh, as I think it ought to be, because I believe in democracy, uh, then I think we do have some work to do here uh, in the United States. So I've covered a lot of ground. Uh, I will stop talking, and I, I look forward to any questions that you have. Thank you very much. Yeah. Um, that gentleman. Um, from uh, Wilson to George W. I'm sorry. From Wilson to George W. Bush, the affirmative um, uh, export of democracy as a as a universal good has been a major theme of a, a certain strain in American political life. Do you uh, agree? A. Do you agree with that? And B. How far do we go as a country in mandating, say, uh, a Russia that has backslid into authoritarianism to reverse that trend, or, or other, say, uh, countries like? like South America, like Asia, uh, Africa, et cetera, how far do we go in mandating uh, that they uh, ad adopt democratic structures? Well, that's a good question. So I would say we don't ever mandate that somebody become a democracy. I mean, it's not in our power to do that. Uh, even when we occupy a country with our military forces, we can't simply mandate that they become, I mean, I think kind of Afghanistan and Iraq kind of prove that. So if they're not indigenous actors that want democracy in a particular society, it's not going to happen. Uh, I think where we can operate, and I think where an organization like the National Endowment uh, is very useful, is basically in leveling the playing field. Because in many countries, you know, the dominant political powers uh, use their power to prevent any kind of open competition, so that even though there actually may be a majority of people that want a certain you know, reform or a more open system, they're not allowed to have it because, you know, that those voices are stifled. And so in that sense, I think, um, uh, you know, helping civil society groups, helping open media, you know, this sort of thing is perfectly legitimate. And in fact, it's had um, really important effects. So for example, one of the early successes of the National Endowment was actually to support the, in the 1980s, to support the Solidarity Labor Movement uh, in Poland, uh, which everybody at the time thought was just a hopeless cause because it was a communist country and they would never, you know, allow a, a democratic labor union to exist. But sure enough, in 1989, that's exactly, you know, what happened. So I do think that there are things that we can do that are useful, but we cannot mandate anything with regard to the, you know, the, the type of political system that other people uh, adopt. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, yes. Uh, Nick Kaufman, uh famously said, it doesn't matter whether a cat is black or white, it only ca matters whether it catches mice. And the, my question is whether it's a misreading of history to about the export of democracy, that really what people are looking at is what systems deliver goods uh, or good cats, uh, catch mice. And whatever the flavor is that accomplishes that, that's what people are will, interested in adopting because they think it will catch mice for them too. And so is that not a more fair reading of what's happened is where we've been more economically successful, people have been more interested in copying all aspects of a system on the ground that will catch mice, and where we, as now, are less competitive in other countries like China are seen as more successful in advancing and their GDPs grow more rapidly, that they're more interested in copying them. So so I think that the actual performance of governments matters for the per perceived legitimacy uh, of those governments. So in China right now, uh, I do think that the Communist Party actually does receive the assent of a lot of Chinese people because it's delivered on growth, on jobs, on, you know, on a lot of things, even if they don't really understand why they've got a right to be ruling over them uh, and so forth. And therefore, um, I think that the ability of a democracy to deliver um, you know, basic uh, uh, public goods, education, health, safety, is really critical. And I think that the failures of many new democracies has been precisely in that area, that they haven't been able, you know, the, the Rose Revolution, I mean, I'm sorry, the, the, the Orange Revolution in Ukraine back in 2004 failed because the new democratically elected uh, uh, officials uh, completely failed to clean up 
uh, corruption, completely failed to reform the public services in Ukraine. And so performance, you know, really, uh, in fact, does matter. I would say, however, that performance is not 100% of the uh, of the story. There is an intrinsic uh, desire of people to have their dignity recognized. And I think that that's one thing that a true democratic rule of law system does. It, you know, so if you think about Mohamed Bouazizi, who was the, f the vegetable seller in Tunisia that started, he triggered uh, the Arab Spring because he had a vegetable cart and it was taken away by the police and he tried to get it back. He couldn't, he couldn't get an answer. The policeman slapped him and then he set himself on fire. And that was such a common experience in that part of the world that it triggered this, you know, set of protests all over the Arab world. And that's not imitating anybody's model. That's just being really pissed off at the fact that your public officials do not take you seriously as a human being. They don't owe you an answer. They don't owe you kind of basic respect, you know, as, as a citizen. And that's what generated this huge amount of uh, anger at all of these regimes. So I think, yes, it is performance that, that makes democracies viable, and we got to worry about our performance, but there is also this intrinsic dimension to a government that actually respects the rights of its citizens that I think people value. How about, uh, let's go to the back. Yeah, how about there? Uh, yes, thank you. Uh, you seem to be implying uh, that the reason that we have so many failed states is because of the corruption in those states, and so you uh, you're sort of postulating the the uh, the opinion the, the, that essentially if we help them clean themselves up, then we have fewer uh, failed states, and then of course we can focus more on some of the domestic issues that we have here. Uh, what I'm wondering is that you've articulated the problem very well, but I'm not sure that that the solution is entirely thought through. Has anybody to your knowledge, been coming up with new forms, new political systems, new for, new political, new social contracts, as it were, that perhaps could fit the 21st century better than the types of political systems that we've developed until now. Well, I. Uh, so my argument is is simply this that it is extremely difficult. So I do believe that. Um, corruption and this basic state failure, this failure to deliver basic services, is at the core of the illegitimacy of many regimes, both democratic and authoritarian. So if you say, why is the Arab world in such disarray right now? It's because I think these authoritarian rulers in Iraq, Syria, Egypt, Yemen, they were all just, I mean, they produced a surface stability, but they did not provide for the education of their populations. They didn't provide basic health care. Reasons that madrasas got such a big start in Egypt and Pakistan was the state was not providing decent public education. And so you wouldn't have this kind of Islamic radicalism if the state had been doing you know, the, the job that the state is really supposed to be uh, doing. So that's the analysis. And yes, I do think that it would greatly enhance the legitimacy if, like China, for example, uh, either a democratic or an authoritarian state could actually provide clean water, education, health, you know, jobs, economic growth, and so forth, right? Now, what's the... Uh, solution to that, uh, that's where I think we've got a big intellectual problem because we've spent a great deal of time thinking about democratic tr transitions, but we have spent very little time thinking about how do you modernize a state? How do you get rid of endemic corruption? How do you clean up you know, uh, uh, how do you build a state that can actually deliver these public services? So in a sense, these two volumes that I've written is my effort to think this through. And part of the answer, I think, actually, that's why I told you this long story about the United States, because we faced exactly that same challenge in the 19th century, and we overcame it politically. You know, in a sense, in the United States, the problem was created by democracy. You know, you wanted to get all these new voters to the polls, so you bribed them. That's what the 
patronage system was about. But then as American democracy matured, we used democratic means to create a coalition in the progressive era to get rid of that kind of patronage. And I think that that's what hap has to happen in a lot of these developing countries. It's not something we can give them. Uh, we can't lecture them about good government and they're gonna say, oh, I didn't understand. You know, okay, well, be good now. You know, that's not the way it works. Uh, it has to be this internal, very difficult uh, political struggle, I think, to really get to, you know, to get to Denmark, so to speak. Uh, why don't we try, uh, how about here? Hi, uh, how do we stop being a vitocracy? What's your blueprint for a reform or revival of the American democracy? You, you, in your book, by the way, you, you seem to imply that uh, war sometimes is the solution. <laughs> no, that's not the solution here. Uh, um, so, one of the, the big problems with the American system is it's extremely conservative, not in the ideological sense, but just it's very hard to change it, very hard to amend the Constitution. So, for example, uh, I think that these Supreme Court decisions that have basically said that money in politics is a form of free speech are terrible. But we're not going to get rid of them. I mean, I don't see any way of getting rid of them unless you wait another generation, you have a different court, and they you know, issue a different uh, set of rulings. And so that avenue of reform is blocked off. Uh, we actually have a project in my center at Stanford to actually come up with a, a set of institutional changes that will at least around the margins help. So for example, there's a number of things you could do to promote uh, third parties. You could dial back uh, primaries or change the, you know, the requirements for primaries. You could go to an alternative vote instead of a first past the post system uh, like we have. You could open up, I mean, I signed on to this um, uh, movement to open up the debates, you know, just as a starting point to third parties to make it easier for alternatives to the two existing parties, you know, to, to get a start. I would get rid of the filibuster. I'd get rid of senatorial holds. Um, you know, it's ridiculous. Every one of a hundred Senators can put a hold on any given executive branch appointment that they want with no, you know, for no reason. I mean, can you imagine running Google in that way if every board member could stop every mid-level management, you know, hiring decision? So, you know, so there are a number of things, uh, but I don't have any illusions that that's going to fundamentally fix the system. I think you're not going to get more fundamental change until you get an inter external shock. And this is where the war thing comes. So I don't want a war, you know. I don't want a big crisis, I don't want an economic collapse, but historically, a lot of times when you're stuck in a certain equilibrium, you need this kind of external shock to shake it loose. I would have thought that the financial crisis of 2008 would have been a big enough shock to actually change things in the system, but you know, today it's as if it didn't happen uh, in terms of the, you know, the fundamental uh, polarization and so forth, so apparently it wasn't big enough. Uh, so I'm not hoping for something like that, but I do think that sometimes, you know, you do need this kind of external uh, um, forcing event, you know, to bring about change, like, you know, something like the assassination of Garfield, which is really what brought about, you know, the kinds of reforms in the progressive era that I was uh, talking about. And again, I don't want any presidents assassinated, right? <laughs> yes. Uh, yes, how about this gentleman right here? Yeah. Thank you. Uh, reading volume one, I noticed that you said a number of times that all the analyses of behavior applied to a Malthusian world. And I might have hoped that the spoiler alert to volume two would say something like the experience of industrialization and abundance is only four or five generations old yeah. and we're still in shock and we'll figure out a way and you'd have some lines of analysis and patterns that would tell us how we you know, fix things going forward. Uh, is there still any hope for anything like that? Have you discarded that qualification? Or am I doomed to be disappointed? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, okay, so just to give a little background on that, uh, what I argued in volume one was really up until the Industrial Revolution, 
the vast majority of everyone in the world was living at subsistence level, which meant that if you wanted to get rich, you could only do it by taking from somebody that you know, taking resources from somebody else. So you're living in the zero sum uh, world, which means that predation, political predation is a perfectly re reasonable strategy. Like if you watch Game of Thrones, how do you get rich in Game of Thrones? You take away someone else's kingdom, right? Uh, whereas once industrialization starts, you have such a high level of productivity and new wealth generation that it ceases to be a zero sum game and it's a positive sum game where everybody can get rich simultaneously simultaneously. And I think that one of the possibilities that's been raised by the kinds of absolute resource constraints that apparently, you know, may raise their ugly head every now and then uh, suggest that we may be heading back to that kind of a world. Now, it turns out that in energy, that's not true. You know, we're not anywhere near peak oil. Uh, we're going to keep pumping this stuff out of the ground, you know, for a long time to come. On the other hand, something like global warming would seem to put an absolute cap on the total amount of a certain kind of economic activity uh, that you can have. And I think that you, you just think about a future world in which nobody could assume economic growth, you know, or, or a high level of economic growth. What would that do to the politics of the United States, of Europe, of you know the developing world? It would be pretty disastrous, because all of a sudden, you know, nobody in aggregate is getting rich, and therefore, if I want to get rich, I got to do it by taking something from you, and that's what returns you to that zero sum kind of world. So I didn't say anything about it. I have no idea. You know, I have no idea what's going to happen in the future. It wouldn't help to write a volume three because it would depend on things that we don't know. You know, we don't know. I mean, it could be that there will be some miraculous new form of energy that somebody will discover next decade that will completely eliminate the constraints, you know, posed by our current dependence on fossil fuels. You know, we don't know. Maybe that'll happen. Uh, so I, I just think you have to stay tuned. And, uh, how about in the front here? He's coming. I just want to thank you for having an outstanding uh, speech. I have a very simple question, which is this. In my youth, I was traveling a lot in the Middle East, and I also worked in the oil industry. And one thing I noticed in certain countries, which now maybe are being criticized for lack of democracy or imperfect democracy, is that there seemed to be absolutely no identification of these Western-educated elites who, in fact, have been brought up went to Oxford, Harvard, wherever, and were imbued with democracy and the people. Mm -hmm. And I'm just wondering if this process of economic globalization is not actually becoming even more conducive to this as trade becomes freer. And so we have these groups of people who are extremely charming, very wonderful, great fun to be with, Gazira Club, the whole thing. And yet at the same time, the capital is shifting abroad and they will look to London, New York, Paris, wherever, as their center of communion, intellectual and financial, and do not look at the people they are actually living amongst as either being their equals or being a somebody or people whom they think they should co-opt into the system. How, how, isn't that a sort of a contradiction? We're opening up the world, but then we're shifting the elites once again in a form, I would say, almost neo-colonialism to very specific places. No, that's a good point. My mentor, Samuel Huntington, identified that kind of person. He called, um, he called him Davos man, you know, that you attend the Davos World Economic Forum every year, and your allegiance is really to your class of other Davos men and women uh, and not to your own country. And I think, you know, that is a problem that um, a lot of uh, the more liberal, liberally oriented elites uh, are mobile and they're more cosmopolitan. Uh, they uh, don't know how to reach out to you know, the countryside to peasants to, you know, ordinary people. So if you look around the world, there's a sociology to these new authoritarian regimes like Viktor Orban in Hungary or Putin in Russia. Uh, they all appeal to the, in a way, the losers from globalization. The people that are not making money as graphics designers or jetting off to Davos, they're stuck in deindustrialized 
cities with skills that they can't really use. And a lot of them are really angry. Uh, and I think, you know, and it's a problem in this country as well, but it's just, it hasn't manifested itself in, in quite the same way. But I think that, uh, you know, this is the support for authoritarian government and a kind of authoritarian backlash against this liberal cosmopolitan world uh, that has emerged as a result of globalization and it could, you know, potentially be uh, quite dangerous. Uh, yes, how about this lady in the front? Thank you. Um, so if uh, a government, um, if it's more important for a government to rid itself of corruption and to provide basic services for its population um, in order to accomplish this new uh, world reform, if that's more important than necessarily being democratically elected or not, how important do you think in terms of accomplishing this goal, um, the separation of church and state is? Uh, by the way, I didn't say that it's necessarily more important. I just said that, you know, democracy is very important. People should have the right to choose their own leaders. Uh, I was simply saying that many democratic governments have failed in this category to actually then deliver on what people want from government. So they got to fix that. But it's not that necessarily that's, that's more important. So, you know, the... Um, <sighs> The question of religion and politics is really quite complicated because in some instances it's actually quite helpful for democratic politics and in other cases it's clearly not. So right now you've got a certain brand of Islamic radicalism that is clearly extremely profoundly anti-democratic, anti-modern, anti kind of everything. And uh, that's not a good you know, model for anything. On the other hand, there's a long line of observers going all the way back to Alexis de Tocqueville that have said that the particular kind of sectarian form of American Protestantism uh, was actually quite helpful for American democracy because that's what cultivated the social capital that was necessary for communities to be self-organizing. It was the basis of the American art of association. It promoted, you know, citizenship and, and so forth. And so I, th I think it, it just depends on the circumstance. You know, there is a, uh, in fact, this is an argument that, my, again, Samuel Huntington made that for much of the 20th century, the Catholic Church was an enemy of democracy. Uh, really up until the Second Vatican Council. I mean, it was on the side of the monarchists, you know, in the Spanish Civil War. It uh, uh, took the side of a lot of authoritarian regimes in, um, you know, in Latin America. But on the other hand, the church has been on the other side. And Pope Francis, you know, looks like he's in the process of moving the church, you know, considerably to the left uh, on, a, on a whole uh, bunch of issues. And you've got liberation theology, you know, that was the other expression of Catholicism in, you know, in Latin America. So I, I just think it's a, you know, it's, it's a very complicated uh, thing. You, liberal politics clearly depends on trying to force religion out of the domain of politics as being the central thing you're fighting about. And that's a lesson that they've really got to learn in the Middle East. But that doesn't mean that religiosity among ordinary people is not at the same time helpful. And, you know, it's, it's part of life. You know, people, that's a dimension of their personhood that, that many people want to express. And in democracy, you know, it seems to me that that's something we want to, um, you know, to protect and, and uh, in some cases even encourage. Uh, let's see. Okay, there. <laughs> so there's all sorts of ways that uh, people can gain power, but in order for that power to be sustainable, they have to have legitimacy. So is are these sources of legitimacy uh, uniform, or can they vary? So d democracy is, you know, a rule of law uh, would be a principle that we would hold dear here, and so that would be you know, what we would expect for legitimacy. Um, but in a country that's maybe less developed, where maybe economic well-being might be more important, that would be a source of legitimacy. Or if it was a different culture, it may be that your belief in a particular, you know, religious teachings might be the source of legitimacy. So if, is it possible for you to have different 
forms of legitimacy to, you know, to sustain that power? Well, I think clearly it is. If you just look at the history of modern Europe, uh, you know, you had kings and queens that were regarded as perfectly legitimate up until, you know, the last century. Uh, so we changed, or the West changed, in, in terms of what it regards as legitimate uh, government. So I think in, in you know, today's world, yeah, there are multiple sources of legitimacy. Democracy is one rule of law, uh, but religion in many countries is an important, you know, support for the the legitimacy, let's say, of the regime in Saudi Arabia. Uh, and performance is also uh, a source of legitimacy. So as, like I was saying about China, uh, the fact that they've been so successful in promoting economic development is a lot of the reason that nobody wants to mess with them because they don't want to kill this goose that's laying all these golden eggs. Uh, so I think you know any regime has got to worry about um, maintaining its legitimacy in, in a, a multiplicity of ways, and if you do not have legitimacy, so this is, I think, the weakness of China, is if your regime is legitimate only because of performance, then what happens when your performance fails? And it's gonna fail in China at some point. I mean, they haven't had a big setback since 1978 when the reform started, but it's gonna happen sooner or later. And that's when these other intrinsic ideological or religious or traditional forms of legitimacy then begin to matter because that's what ties you over, you know, uh, uh, a rough stretch. Okay. Uh, I want to thank you very, very much.